Hey, welcome to March Madness, and I'm not talking about basketball and sports here, Tim. We're talking about all the hunting stuff and all the work that needs to be done in the month of March. So stay with us. That's what this episode's all about. Hi, this is Tim and Dole. Welcome to Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbasses. A podcast about the outdoors, hunting, and and being a steward of the land. Hey, welcome to Midwest Hunting and Outdoors by Two Dumbasses. Tim, we're going to be talking March Madness, and we're not talking basketball or sports. Um, We are talking about all the work that we've got ahead of us if you're an outdoors person in the month of March or this time of year to get ready for uh, hunting season in the off season. And there's a lot to that, right? I mean, we've got, I don't know, four or five five topics, I think. Yeah, we're going to talk about the top five, but, uh, you know, the list could be a lot longer than five. So, should we get right into it? Yeah, I think our, our first one we're going to talk about is frost seeding. Frost seeding. What is frost seeding and why should we do it? So, so we've done a lot of research on, on uh, frost seeding because, I mean, I think if you, you can do it wrong, right? If you do it wrong, uh, you get your seed out there too soon or, or too late, your seed's basically going to die. So, I did a lot of research. I've got some areas to where I want to frost seed and... Uh, we're just going to share those learnings. So, so what is frost seeding? It's basically a process of uh, broadcasting out your seed of your desired plants early in the spring to allow snow and frost to work the seed into the soil. So, you remember Aaron from the the food plot Scientologist guy that we had on our episode? He explained it to me: is is hey, when you are when you basically put that seed and we get into this time of year and the best time of year to frost seeds february to the end of march and what you're doing is is you are spraying that seed and it's it's very important it has soil contact and what happens is is that seed that very small seed is laying on that dirt and what's happening is is hey when it thaws you know that seed kind of slowly sinks into the dirt and then it freezes again and then that frost and thaw cycle actually pulls that seed just ever so gently into the dirt ideal for germination yeah it's awesome so it's really kind of a no well first of all it's simple a simple approach and it really is kind of a type of a no uh, no plow uh, no till approach that's right people have been doing it for neons right neons, yep yeah Hey, if you like what these two dumbasses are doing, please hit the like button and subscribe today. So, you know, a couple things that I've got that I'm interested in are, hey, clover, clover. Uh, also, hey, I've got some areas where we're putting in fencing and we talked fencing, you know, last week and uh, so we had a bulldozer clear out a bunch of areas. So now, hey, I've got to go back and reseed some of my CRP area. And it's like, well, gosh, can I seed, can I frost seed that stuff in? So part of my research is, hey, what seed is receptive uh, for frost seeding? So first off, like, hey, your lawn grass, not receptive for frost seeding. There are certain times of year to put your, your grass seed in. But that does not apply to prairie grass. Okay. Oh, so prairie grass is different than... Prairie grass is different. Okay. Because if you think about it, like, hey, this grass, it grows up super tall and it develops those flowers of seeds. All season long, it's or all winter long, it's going through that frost cycle and it's dropping through the wind, etc. And it's dropping that seed into the ground. Okay. So it's normal for it. Cool. Uh, But a couple others, like clovers are very receptive to uh, frost seeding. Rye grasses, prairie grasses, as I mentioned, chicories and wheat and oats are all receptive to that. But uh, again, I think you just want to make sure you hit that that, uh, February to late March time frame so that you get the benefit of the frost cycle. Tim, any uh, watch outs on frost seeding? Like areas maybe you wouldn't want to do frost seeding? So erosion areas, I think. 
Um, I think you'd still get some benefit, but here's the watch out, right? If you're on a pretty good size slope, uh, I think what's going to end up happening is, is it's going to frost seeds going to work, but all that grass is going to be concentrated or that those seeds will be concentrated down below. And, or uh, since we're talking very small seeds, if it's eroding, that dirt, it gets too much over the top of it and then just kills the seed. Gets too cut too deep. And yeah, yeah very good question. By the way. Yeah. 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 How about uh, on top of snow? Uh, so it can work on top of snow, not necessarily recommended. Uh, depends on what you're planting. So th remember, we're talking about very small seeds. And, you know, sometimes those snow covers can have a little bit of a crust on them. So you might not have the erosion impact, but you'd have the wind erosion. So you get these little fine seeds and it'll blow them right off the top of the snow. Okay, like the crystal frozen, hard, crusty snow. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah, we, we planted, my wife and I planted, uh, reseeded our clover field um last weekend and we had a half inch to three quarters of an inch of snow and uh man it worked great i mean by the afternoon the snow was gone yeah. so what a great head start that uh that clover is going to have another great example of hey just paying attention to the forecast and hey if i got a little cover then i would think there'd be no problem let common sense prevail cool cool any other thing on frost seeding? Yeah, so let's talk about seed rates. You know, a lot of times we get we'll get questions on what seed rates. You know, we when we do our our food plot seed that we do in the fall. You know, the dumbass blend. You know, a lot of people ask us, "Like, hey, what's the seed rate?" Well, well, there is a seed rate for frost seeding. So it really depends on the seed that we're trying to plant. I've, I've pulled out a couple. So for clovers that. If it's a first time of seeding, that eight to 10 pounds an acre uh, for clovers is ideal. For chicory, it's about four to five pounds per acre uh, for, uh, for that. And those, again, those are all broadcast rates. Um, and so those, those seed rates are really for fresh crops, meaning, hey, bare ground, bare ground and there's no clover or chicory there from last year. Now, another thing with that is these small little seeds have to have soil contact. So if you have duff, uh, duff from soybeans or from corn, et cetera, from the previous year, you're probably not gonna get a great germination rate. So super important that, hey, if you know in the fall that I wanna be frost seeding and turning this field into a clover field next year, you have to prepare that in the fall so that when you come into spring, it's ready to go. Makes sense. Yep. Now there's another concept called overseeding, right? So um, it, for those of you who follow us, we have uh, here at this property, 30 acres of CRP roughly. And of that CRP, I have fire breaks all around it. And so I have, my fire breaks are made up of clover, clover and chicory etc a couple other little things and i need to overseed it so hey i have something that's present but the deer have eaten it down or through drought etc i have some patches so i'm going to call that overseeding so if i want to overseed we want to basically just replant into those those bare sp bare spots so from a clover perspective overseeding two to four pounds an acre. And for a chicory, it's one to two pounds per acre. Nice. Um, so we talked about timing. Uh, we talked about preparing the dirt. Um, essentially that wraps up frost seeding 101. Yeah, and we're, we are in Southern Iowa. So just from a location standpoint, but like the time is now. Um, in fact, we probably got days, if not week, week and a half, two weeks here before uh, we, we lost the window. Yep. Right? That's so right. And then you're into regular April food plot production. So. That's right. Cool. Any last uh, key points before we go to bullet point number two? Nope. I just think, uh, I think uh, frost seeding is a nice, nice option if you're going to be putting in a plot or if you're going to be overseeding. So 
certainly consider that and uh, I think you'll have good success. Yeah, yeah, good luck with that. Number two, tree stand placement. So Tim, we're talking about, again, March, really most people would consider March winter. Um, we're talking tree stands. Why tree stand placement? Well, it's because uh, you just got done with hunting season. Uh, you've been locked in the house for uh, months at a time here, and you've been mulling around in your head, hey, what did I learn new this year that I want to apply uh, to this year's tree stands, food plots, hunting game, right? That's right. So, um, so you want to be thinking, where do I have my existing tree stands, and, and do I, which ones do I want to keep where? And then what did I learn from you know, travel patterns from the deer during hunting season from a tree stand or an area? Um, that I may may want to explore um, getting into uh, different areas, setting up new tree stands, new towers, whatever. Yeah, you know, I I learned a lot this year. You just jumping in there just a little bit, just with regards to hey, neighbors are now changing food plots. They're putting in food plots. There's new fences, fence types going up. Uh, we had the drought. All those things. And there were some new patterns that emerged that I hadn't seen before. Yeah, and we've used some new technology, right, to get a little bit of insight uh, on these deer patterns, right? So um, why don't you tell the folks about that? Yeah, the drone. So we did a, uh, it just gives you a whole nother perspective, right? So, you know, we, as we look at our ground, we're always looking at it just like this, and you can't really see necessarily the patterns. I mean, obviously, you, you can see for small trails, but if you see like wide, a wide pattern of, of a deer trail, I don't know if you'd necessarily see it. Anyway, when we had, took the drone up and we were playing around with it, we saw some emerging deer trails that were, you know, 10, 15 feet wide. They, I don't know if you would have saw. From 80 feet in the air, they just looked obvious. Yeah. Right. Very, and they, they, if they look obvious from 80 feet in the air, it's a good trail. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we're, I'm excited to see how that uh, plays into your strategy this year. So, so that being said on tree stands, I think the other thing, and we're not talking about moving them because many of them are frozen at this stage, but <clears throat> it's a good time to find that tree that you're going to put the tree stand in, maybe even doing some trimming and uh, doing some work around the tree in that area to to help clean it up uh, you're not fighting bugs you're not fighting ticks and you're not fighting um, you know all the vegetation that's going to grow up uh, come come summer so you and i as we prep for this there's key times to really put these stands in right what what are the key times for you for me it's uh, may uh, may or uh, late july or august um, and the reason I say that is because I'm trying to beat, again, that heavy vegetation and bugs and, and wood ticks. I'm also trying to avoid turkey season. So it's like middle of May to late May when fourth season's over. Um, and if I can't hit that window, then I'm looking for a nice, nice weather at the end of July, early August. that I can get in and do the same. Yeah, that's what I find, too. You know, my, my problem is, is in May. And I think May is the ideal time. But that's when food plots, you know, food plot starts to come up. I'm mowing the yard. There's just a whole lot going on in May and early June, right? Because we have so many seeds that we want to plant that, I mean, you can't plant to the soil 60 degrees. Well, that's all happening in that same window. Yeah, and graduations and weddings. And yeah, there's always life gets in the way, right? Sure does. But, uh, yeah. All right. Anything else we missed on uh, tree stand placement? I don't think so. I mean, we could go do a whole episode on different types of tree stands, but I don't think that's really necessary yeah. for here. Okay. Number three. So, again, just rehashing frost seeding, tree placement. Number three is uh, evasive species, specifically wild garlic mustard. So why now, why now? Yeah, we've done several episodes on wild garlic mustard, and we'll include those links up here um, and maybe a few video clips. But... Why it's so important right now is wild garlic mustard is the first plant, herb, to uh, actually grow and green up in your forest at this time of the year. February, March, certainly by April, it's, uh, it's going. And it uh, starts off, it's a biannual plant. It uh, starts off with rosettes, 
um, on the ground. And then in year two, it grows that big stem out the top and has the flowers. It's invasive for a couple of reasons. One, each, each flower has over 100 seeds, <coughs> so it can populate an area very quickly. And this plant contains some type of chemical that uh, kills the fungus, some funguses in the soil. And then uh, that fungus isn't there to uh, inhibit other natural uh, plants to grow. So it's almost like a herbicide. It has its own herbicide effect. Really? So if you've, if you've had any experience with wild mustard garlic, this stuff, uh, once it starts growing, uh, it's tough to get a grasp on it. But now is the time to do it because, again, it's the really the only green plant out there. You're going to be able to see it really easy. You can spray it without killing all the other plants around it using glyphosate um, and get a head jump on it. That's good. Yeah. yeah, it's just not something we want to mow, right? I mean, uh, No, you don't want to mow it, and you really don't want to pick it unless you can get the whole root. And then you don't want to pick it and throw it on the ground. It's going to come back, and in a, in a, you got to pick it, put it in a garbage uh, bag, and then throw it away. Okay. It's evasive. It's really bad, really bad. So... Check out uh, for, you know, get more educated on the plant itself. Check out that link up here. Um, you'll, you'll, once you see it, you'll know you got it. Okay. Number four, uh, I'm calling this tree stand displacement slash TSI, which is tree stand improvement. So now is the perfect time if the ground's still frozen to get your equipment in there, do some hinge cutting, uh, cut out some areas that uh, you may be able to create some, it's all about food. So you're cutting areas down to create either browse through the stumps that will grow back, or in some cases, uh, some food plot opportunity. And in all cases, to create sun down to the ground that that natural browse can start growing that the deers can get to and that's your attractant. Yeah, you've done a lot of that on your property. We've done a lot of it and we're in the middle of a four acre project now and I'm excited to get that done here uh, this month. So now, does the state help you with that? I mean, how? what's, uh, great. what's the process? Yeah, great question. Uh, one, you can do it on your own, but I would encourage you, one, to get your uh, your district forester involved or your biologist involved. Have them come out, look at what you're thinking. Uh, they'll educate you on it. And uh, there is cost share options out there, either through Equip or REAP or other programs that the state uh, the state has for uh, TSI. Okay, excellent. Yeah, but again, it's all about uh, the ground being frozen hard enough that you can get your equipment in there and and not create ruts and sink up to your uh, knees. So I do have one more question. It's like, hey, yeah. how do you how do you pick that four acres? Why that four acres? It uh, it already has existing two small food plots in those four acres, and um, I really want to expand. I'm having a difficult time of getting perennials growing in there uh, because of the shade. Yep. So I wanted to open it up to get more sun to these existing food plots. And then I wanted to open up that whole four acres to get uh, some shaded food plot habitat going. Sure. I, I'm going to try oats, uh, oats in some of that area. And then what the oats won't grow, I know there'll be some natural grasses and some natural uh, food food that, that comes up. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? No, did I miss anything on tree stand improvement? I don't think so. Okay, and then last but not least, coming into the final... Soil samples. Soil samples and food plot strategy. Yeah, so so the last thing in our March Madness, last topic is soil samples. And the first step really is, is what's your, what's your food plot strategy, right? So I think we've created a couple of episodes on food plots or cover, cover crops for food for the deer and I think you got to figure out what your strategy is we're not going to go super in depth to that but do you want to are you going to have a, a food plot that you're going to cover your ground that will be a fall food supply or is this going to be do I want to put in just a, a cover crop that I'm going to end up so let me give an example of that buckwheat I'll put in buckwheat and then right before August I'm going to take care of that and then start to layer in 
uh, brassica food plot, so it'd be a food uh, fall food plot. You should know what your strategy is going to be. The next step is, is hey, uh, uh, where are you going to get your your uh, soil test from? So lots of lots of choices out there. Um, we are actually using the Whitetail Institute. I actually tried to get it from another uh, service that offered a free service, and uh, that did, kind of it fell through. Did not work out. Didn't work out. Yeah, we'll just leave it at that. And uh, so, um, so stay tuned more on that. Uh, but then the next, so part of so once you get your your soil sample, the next thing is is you gotta you gotta go out and figure out those food plots, know what you're going to be planting in those food plots or those fields, and try to get a representative amount of soil so that you can submit that sample. Again, we're going to have an episode just on soil samples later on. But And then, and then the, when's, the time, when's the best time to do that? The best time to do that is spring. So March, April, really as soon as the ground's thawed enough, that you can go start to get some dirt that's the time to do this and uh and then what you're going to do is you're going to want to make sure you're, that you get that representative amount and mix it all up so that for that field you got a good sample so we have like uh i have like four different fields three fields in general that are that i pretty much plant similar things and then those of you guys who followed our our dove hunting it's a whole different that's a whole different uh, type of product that we're growing up there. So I'm going to split the samples that way so that we understand. And then the results that we'll get back will tell us what we've got to plant onto it. So, And I think Whitetails is going to ask us, uh, ask you, you know, what are you planning on planting in here? And then part of their analysis is when they do the sample is it'll come back and say, well, based on the pH and then here's the soil, what it, uh, is in the soil uh, for clover, for example, Tim, you plan on planting clover, here's the fertilizer and the amount of fertilizer we recommend. Yeah. Which is, well, you just can't ask for much more than that. Nope, it's exactly what you need. Yeah. Yep. Right. So, so really those are your next steps and I really, I encourage you to get these soil samples done uh, so that, you know, you're set up for success. Yeah, that seems like a lot of work in uh, you know two to four weeks here, Tim, to get done. We didn't even talk about hey, you got to still put in your fertilizers and acquire that and your pre-emergence and all that other stuff. If yeah. that's what you choose to. A lot do. going on. A lot going on there. Yeah. But I think this is uh, you know timing is right right now. Uh, we'll, we'll get this released here uh, mid mid March or this episode released mid March or third week in March. And the time is right for most locations in the Midwest, at least, um, for these things to be happening. Absolutely. So, any last thoughts? Help. This is good. Awesome. Yeah, I've been feeling a little overwhelmed of all the stuff I got to get done. I, I am also. I am also. <laughs> Folks, until next time, be, be safe, safe, have fun, and, and get, get outdoors. outdoors. Thanks for listening or watching our show. We have some exciting topics and guests coming up. We ask that you subscribe to our channel on YouTube and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. We look forward to hearing your suggestions for topics, questions, and comments. This is Two Dumbasses signing off. Until next time, be, be safe, safe, have, have fun, fun, and, and get, get outdoors. outdoors.